Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we continue our study of the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to be starting our study of the book of Numbers tonight. So you'll want to turn there in your Bibles. One thing before we get into the study, I want to make a little announcement here. Uh, if you come down to the church house looking for me, I have moved out of the church office, the preacher's office, and I have set up my office in one of the close by classrooms. In fact, it's classroom number five, just right around the corner, right across, across the hall from uh, the Rattler bag room. And I want you to know this is at the prodding of absolutely no one. Uh, the elders have not asked me to do this. Aurelio has not asked me to do this. I wanted to do this myself. And to tell you the truth, once now that I am set up in there, I prefer it than the space in the preacher's office. It's, I just really enjoy the setup. So don't think that anyone has uh, pressured me to do this. This was all my doing. And I'm happy as a clam where I am. So if you come to look for me, just come to that classroom number five. And that's where my office is right now. All right, getting into our study of the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers gets its name from the censuses that were taken as recorded in this book in chapters 1, chapter 3, and chapter 26. Uh, the Greek word, and I suppose this came from the Septuagint, the Greek name for that is Erethmoi. That was the Greek name for uh, that book of the Bible, for the book of Numbers, and it means numbers. Uh, the Hebrew word is something much different, and I'm not going to venture a pronunciation of that name, uh, but it means in the wilderness. And the Hebrew name for the book better fits the book itself than does the Greek term numbers because it's about the experience of God's people as they are in the wilderness. So we'll be looking at more than just God taking account of the people of Israel, though uh, the study will involve that, but it's about their time in the wilderness. Um, only two people who were over 20 years of age when Israel left the land of Egypt lived through the wanderings of the desert and finally entered into the promised land. As we'll see later, probably from your own study of the Old Testament, you know who that is. That's Joshua and Caleb men who were very courageous uh, in spying out the land and knew that since God had promised that he would give it to the people of Israel, then that would be fulfilled. God would completely fulfill his promise. And so Joshua and Caleb were the only ones of that earlier generation that would uh, be able to enter into that land. The promised land itself is frequently referred to as a place of rest. This is seen uh, throughout Scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 3, in verse 20. God promises that he will give rest to the people of Israel as they occupy the land that the Lord your God gives them beyond the Jordan. So they looked at this as a place of rest, and that's what made it really a, a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, chapter 12 and verse 10, much the same thing. Beyond the Jordan, there will be a land that they will inherit, that they will have in it rest from all of their enemies. In Joshua chapter 1, in verses 13 to 15, remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan 
toward the sunrise. So the theme of rest has always been important to God's people. Even in gospel times, Jesus, during his ministry, spoke to people who were beleaguered with life. They were tired. They were in a lot of turmoil. They had uh, worry and anxiety about their sin. They had worry and anxiety about society. They had worry and anxiety about their health. They were anxious people, just like people today are anxious people. And so the invitation that Jesus offers to those people of his day is an invitation that will ring relevant to people of every age in every location. Consider the sweetness of this, this invitation in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 28. Come to me, all who are labor, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And John, in the middle of his revelation, in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, John says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. You know, it may be that for some people, the idea of an eternal rest is not all that appealing, maybe because they haven't worked themselves very hard in this life. And so rest and ease may be something that they're very familiar with. Uh, but Jesus promises rest to the weary. Jesus promises rest to those who have given themselves in labor to God. Now, the book of Numbers also tells of Israel's wanderings in the desert from the time that they were at Mount Sinai until they arrived at the edge of the promised land at the east of the Jordan River. Moses has long been recognized as the author of the book of Numbers. And in fact, the first five books of the Old Testament, the entire law was attributed by, to Moses by Jesus and other writers of books of the Bible. Uh, Jesus considered Moses as having authored uh, the first five books. In John chapter one and verse 17, this is seen in John's gospel where he says the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So it was widely recognized and acknowledged that Moses was the author of this book as he was the rest of the first five books of the Old Testament. The date of the book of Numbers was probably around the time of 1406 B.C., uh, completed shortly after Moses' death. Moses died in 1406 B.C. in the 40th year of Israel's wanderings. The book covers a span of 39 years. Numbers begins with a census of the Israelites that was taken at Mount Sinai a month after the tabernacle was completed. Numbers also records murmurings of God's people against God and against Moses. These murmurings are seven in total. The first one is in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 1. It says the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then in verse 4, the rabble that was among them had a strong craving and the people of Israel also wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. Then in chapter 14 and verse 2, all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness. Uh, and so they griped and complained constantly against God and against God's leadership. We're told in chapter 16 and verses 1 and 2 that uh, the Korah, the son of Izhar, uh, and Dathan, 
griped against God. They rose up before Moses in verse 2 with a number of people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly, well-known men who griped against God's leadership in the persons of Moses and Aaron. Now, all of this griping and complaining brought Israel a lot of trouble. And God has never smiled on this kind of attitude. Now, I want you to consider this. Israel was a people who had lived in slavery in the land of Egypt. But once they got out in the wilderness, where maybe where your next meal came from was suspect, whether or not you were going to have water, whether or not the wilderness itself was going to destroy you, all of these unknowables in the wilderness caused the people of Israel to start feeling kind of insecure, whether they will have enough. Uh, they may feel a threat from beasts in the wilderness. Whatever the case is, they don't feel secure, even though God has clearly delivered them. And they complain against God. They complain against Moses. They complain against Aaron. Now, the reason I set this up like this is this. If God was not pleased with the people of Israel complaining the way they did while they were in the wilderness, and we, let, we take a look at Israel's situation in the wilderness, And if we're being honest with ourselves, we may look at what they griped about. And if we're being honest, we may say, you know, I can understand why they were uncertain. I can understand why they were unhappy. I can understand why they were uncomfortable. I can understand that. If Israel complained in the midst of a difficult situation and God was not pleased with it. How much more do you suppose God is not pleased with a people today who have been given relatively a great deal of comfort, a great deal of reason for confidence? things going very well, and yet people still complain. Well, just in case we wonder if God has changed his view about people who gripe and complain and murmur, here's what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 2, in verses 14 and following. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul says, make sure you don't gripe and complain. Well, why, Paul? Why, why should I be so conscientious that I don't gripe and complain? He says, because if I gripe and complain, that makes me blameworthy. That makes me guilty. That makes me blemished before God. Because he says, if I don't do these things, I will be blameless and innocent and without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. You see, it, it's not sufficient for us to claim as an excuse. Everybody else is doing it. Society does complain. Society does vent. Society does take on. And sometimes, have you ever found yourself 
in a conversation with a friend and you catch yourself, you realize you're griping too much. Or maybe you realize you're gossiping. Whatever the case is, and then your conscience gets to you a little bit and your friend tries to make you feel better by saying something like, well, we all need to be able to vent. You ever heard that? If you feel a twinge of conscience when you're griping and complaining or gossiping, and your friend says, well, we all need to be able to vent, it might be a good idea to listen more to your conscience than you do to your friend. Because our conscience may be telling us we're going too far. We're griping too much. We're gossiping. And it needs to stop. God doesn't appreciate murmuring and complaining. It brought trouble upon the people of Israel. And it will bring trouble on the people of God in any generation. The lesson that is made clear throughout the book of Numbers is this. God's people can move forward only insofar as they trust God's promises and lean on his strength. They have to be reminded that the battle is God's, not their own. They have to be reminded that God will give them victory. God will give them success. They simply must trust him and obey him. They do that and they will have success. Now, the first census of the people of Israel is found in Numbers chapter 1. Only the men over 20 years old were counted. Twelve men helped Moses take this census. Uh, one of them was a man by the name of Nashon, who is the son of Amenadab of the tribe of Judah. Now, what's significant about this man is that he is listed as being one of the ancestors of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1 in verse 4. And so all of these men helped Moses count the people of Israel, taking the census. The tribes were counted separately. The tribe that had the largest population was Judah. The tribe that had the smallest population was Manasseh. The Levites were not counted in the census. Uh, because special provision was made for them as far as their upkeep and as their as far as their welfare is concerned. Uh, so they were not included in this census. The arrangement of the tribes and the order for the march of the tribes is given in chapter two in chapter two. The twelve tribes were grouped into four groups of three tribes each. These groups were camped around the tabernacle on four sides. Now, if you can imagine the tabernacle in the middle of the camp of the people of Israel, and within the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, what does that tell you as far as God's vantage point, what is most important? What does that tell you? Doesn't it tell you that God has promised the people of Israel that he will protect them, that he will be with them, but it is their responsibility to protect the tabernacle. It is their responsibility to protect the Ark of the Covenant. And this will only be done when they themselves trust God and do what God calls them to do. And so it's, it's interesting to me in this great encampment of a population of about 603,000 people, uh, as far as the men were concerned, this great encampment, right in the middle was the tabernacle. And within the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant because God wanted that protected from marauders, from invaders. Israel was to protect it at every cost, and God would protect Israel. In 
In Numbers chapter 3, you have the census of the Levites. Now, the Levites were taken by God for his service instead of the firstborn from each family. There were 22,000 Levites counted. This is what Numbers chapter 3 and verse 39 tell us. All those listed among the Levites whom Moses and Aaron listed at the commandment of the Lord by clans, all the males from a month old and upward were 22,000 people. The first 273 firstborn in excess of the number of the Levites were redeemed by their families for payment of five shekels of silver each. Now, God also had a specific work for the Levites to be engaged in. This work is given to them in Numbers chapter 4. The Levites were to pack up the tabernacle in preparation for moving to other places. They had a method for this packing of the Ark of the Covenant without ever looking at it. Notice in chapter 4, in verses 4 and 5, this is the servant. This is the service of the sons of Koath in the tent of meeting, the most holy things. When the camp is to set out, Aaron and his sons shall go in and take down the veil of the screen and cover the ark of the testimony within it. Then they shall put on it a covering of goat skin and spread it on top of that a cloth of all blue and it shall and shall put it on its poles and over the table of the bread of the presence they shall spread a cloth of blue and put it on the plates the dishes for the incense the bowls and the flagons for the drink offering the regular showbread shall also be put on it now what's interesting about this is that they were able to take care of transporting the ark of the covenant without looking at it. They were very concerned to be extremely careful about what they did here. Uh, they transported the tabernacle by poles on their shoulders and parted wagons. The Levites also assisted the priest in the work around the tabernacle. The instruction for this is given in chapter 3 in verses 8 and 9 and chapter 8 in verse 22. Aaron and his son, Aaron was the high priest. His sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithmar were also priests before God. And the camp was to be kept pure. In Numbers chapter 5, in verses 1 to 4, the instruction is given to keep the camp pure like this. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or who is, has a discharge, and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp, that they may not defile the camp, and in the midst of which I dwell. And the people of Israel did so, and put them outside the camp, as the Lord said to Moses. So the people of Israel did. Now I want us to consider something here. Sometimes. With our modern minds, we tend to think that compassion is primary. That compassion rules every other consideration. Not here. Not here in Numbers chapter 5. And you could make the argument that it's at least our view of compassion that is not to be considered primary. What God considers primary here in Numbers chapter 5 is his holiness and this dwelling place to be kept clean. And it's not to be defiled by anyone for any reason. It is to be kept completely clean, free from any uncleanness. Um, the book goes on. There is the restitution for wrongs that a person might commit. In Numbers chapter 5, uh, verses 5 to 10. When people did wrong, they were to confess their wrongdoing and make full restitution for what they had taken. 
also make a penalty payment of one-fifth of its value. Look with me at Numbers chapter 5, verses 5 to 10. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel. When a man or woman commits any of the sins that people commit by breaking faith with the Lord, and that person realizes his guilt, he shall confess his sin that he has committed, and he shall make full restitution for his wrong, adding a fifth to it and giving it to him whom he did wrong. But if the man has no next of kin to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for wrong shall go to the Lord for the priest, in addition to the ram of atonement with which atonement is made for him. And every contribution, all the holy donations of the people of Israel, which they bring to the priest, shall be his. Each one shall keep his holy donations. Whatever anyone gives to the priest shall be his. And so these were uh, the rules concerning restitution for wrongdoing. Further instruction is given in Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 16 about making restitution for what one has done wrong. And the priest is to receive a portion of this. Since the priest did not have an inheritance in land, uh, he did not enjoy the same inheritance as the rest of the people of Israel, he was provided for in means such as this. Then in Numbers chapter 5, verse 11 to 31, there is the test for an unfaithful wife. Numbers chapter 5, verse 11 and 31, 11 to 31. If a man suspected that his wife was guilty of adultery with another man, he could bring her to the tabernacle for a test. She was to drink water containing dust from the tabernacle floor. If she was innocent, no ill effects would follow. If she was guilty, her abdomen would swell. This is what the text teaches us in chapter 5, 16 to 24, and chapter 5, and verse 27. Now, looking at that with modern eyes may seem ridiculous. It would certainly be unacceptable to the modern feminist mindset for a wife to be put on trial in such a way and to have such, as far as our modern eyes are concerned, uh, have such an absurd test for her to be put through. It sounds superstitious for our modern eyes. But what we have to remember is that God was in control of this thing. And also you have to remember that when the woman if she was innocent, when if she was innocent, when she came through and she was proven innocent, it prevented her husband from taking any uh, taking any meanness out on her, because she has been proven innocent before God and before the people. And this wasn't un uncommon in. Um, culture at this time. There were several tests like this among other cultures and other societies, how a woman was tested whether or not she was innocent by what happened to her. Also, there was instruction given for the Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6 and verses 1 to 21. Nazarites were a special class of men set apart from some unusual service. Most of the information about them is found in Numbers chapter 6. The most famous Nazarites that we know of are Samson, Samuel the prophet, and John the Baptist. Uh, the texts about them are, of course, Judges chapter 13, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and Luke chapter 1, respectively. The Nazarites were forbidden to drink wine or fermented drink or to eat grapes. Anything that came from the vine they were forbidden. They were forbidden to shave or cut their hair, and they were forbidden to touch a dead body. Uh, when we think of Samson, for instance, we can see how Samson violated the Nazarite vow in every respect. He was a very worldly man who lived by the code of society rather than by the code of God. Um, and so it was, it was a special class of men. 
who are set apart from the rest of society for a particular purpose. Then in chapter 7 of the book of Numbers, there's instruction given for the offerings by the leaders. When the tabernacle was completed and consecrated, the leaders of Israel made special gift for its operation. Carts, which were really wagons and 12 oxen, were given to help transport it. The leader of each tribe gave a silver plate, a silver bowl, a gold dish, a bull, rams, lambs, two oxen, and goats. The list of the gifts is repeated for all 12 tribes of Israel, and it seems repetitious, but it reminds us that God observes all of our gifts individually. The Levites are purified in Numbers chapter 8 and verses 5 to 26. The presentation and purification of the Levites for their service in the tabernacle was an event to be witnessed by everyone and to be participated in by the community. And those who ministered in these purifications must themselves be purified. The Levites were considered an offering to the Lord in chapter 8 and verse 15. And so they were to do service for the priest. And we have to remember that as Christians, we ourselves are a holy nation of priests before God. And so the book of Numbers has much uh, that is applicable to the Christian because just as a select class of people lived among the society of Israel, so today the church lives as a select class of people among the society of the world. We are to be different. We are to hold ourselves more closely to the righteous and rigorous standard of God. Doesn't mean we don't have compassion and mercy and grace. Of course, we do have all of those things. But it does mean that we are to take very seriously God's call for our holiness in our lives. That's all we've got for today. We will continue this next week. God bless you until next time. Bye-bye.